Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the final day of the ACT Annual Conference. I'm James Winston, an Associate Director for Policy and Technical at the ACT. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Sarah Breeden from the Bank of England. Um, so welcome, Sarah. And I, I should actually start by congratulating you, Sarah, because on May the 27th, the course of the Bank of England appointed Sarah as Executive Director for Financial Stability, Strategy and Risk. And she will also become a member of the Financial Policy Committee. Sarah is moving from her current role as Executive Director for UK Deposit Takers Supervision, where she's overseen UK firms through the COVID crisis, and she shapes the bank's work um, on climate change. So in this session, Sarah has kindly agreed to talk to the ACT about accelerating strategic change, the climate change agenda, and its implications for a sustainable finance revolution. To make the session more interactive, Sarah has suggested a Q&A format. So please submit any questions in the Q&A box that by now you should be familiar with, but you'll find this under the participate tab of the toolbar at the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we will try to consolidate your questions by theme and to tackle them as we go along. So please don't wait until the end to send them in. The session, like the others, is being recorded and will be made available to view for the next 30 days. Now, on the first day of our conference, we heard Andrew Bailey, Governor of the Bank of England, reflecting on last weekend's G7 summit, um, the impact of the COVID crisis on economic policy and regulation. Andrew also highlighted the importance of climate change initiatives in the lead up to the COP26 climate conference being held in Glasgow in November this year. And I'll be asking Sarah shortly to go into more detail on those initiatives. But first, um, Sarah, please, can you tell us just a little bit more about yourself and your new role at the bank? Uh, thanks, James, for that kind introduction. And thanks to the ACT for uh, inviting me uh, today. As you said, uh, James, uh, I'm currently the executive director at the bank responsible for supervision of UK banks. But over the summer, I get to move to the financial stability uh, area. What's common across both roles is that what we're trying to do is ensure that financial institutions are there to serve the real economy, to serve uh, the ACT's membership in bad times as well as good. Uh, currently in my role, that's through ensuring individual UK firms are safe and sound. Whereas in the new role, it will obviously be much broader than that, both because we're looking at the system as a whole, including the role of non-banks. Uh, and we're thinking in financial stability, not just about how to ensure things are there in bad times as well as uh, in good, but how to ensure that we can uh, support the development of financial services, ensuring there's provision of long-term investment, uh, perhaps. So I think the, the, the role that I'll have is of immense interest uh, to your uh, membership, I hope. Uh, certainly we'll be aiming to uh, ensure that uh, the financial system does what it needs to, which is uh, support the business community as it goes about providing uh, uh, opportunities and jobs and uh, development. And climate is a common thread through all of those uh, roles. Indeed. Um, thank you, Sarah. May I suggest we start with the big um, picture questions about the geopolitics of climate change? and then um, drill down into the role of policymakers and regulators, including the Bank of England itself, um, before examining the implications for the financial sector as a whole. And finally, for the corporate treasurers that you mentioned uh, as clients of the financial sector. So starting with the first of those, um, uh, Sarah, what are your reflections on the G7 summit and what it tells the business world about the accelerating agenda for tackling climate change? So I had four reflections. Usually one has three, but on this occasion uh, I had four. The first is that multilateralism is back, that people are working together across the international community to, uh, to drive change. The second reflection that climate is an enormous focus not just for leaders and for those in environmental ministries, but in the finance ministry and central bank finance track. 
as well. So you can think of climate change as definitely having arrived in the business, the financial and the macroeconomic uh, community. My third reflection is that the ambition is clear. All of the G7 have committed to net zero by 2050. 125 other governments around the world have, have joined them in that uh, commitment. And that means there's a clear recognition that this is the key economic challenge for the world as it recovers from COVID. And then my final thought, and this is where the rubber hits the road, is this is a complex multi-year program of work that involves the whole of government, the whole of the real economy and the whole of the financial system. What does that mean for uh, people listening to you and I chatting here today, James? Uh, be focused on net zero. It really is happening. Governments are aiming to build back cleaner and greener. So think about how actions now can help support green growth as our economy uh, recovers. And frankly, we need the help of business. It's innovation and action from business that's going to get us to net zero. So please start now. Uh, and Sarah, you, you rightly highlighted the, the sort of economic implications. And of course, it, it might be a bit obvious, but for today's audience, that's the area we're focusing on. But of course, the G7 summit communique said that um, the unprecedented and interdependent crises of climate change and biodiversity loss pose an existential threat to people, prosperity, security and nature. So within this sort of overall context of that's the big problem and we're looking at the economic bit, what, what outcomes should we expect to see from COP26 itself in November? Well, I, th I think COP creates an enormous focus for everyone. Events like that always do. It means uh, people say, by COP, we will do something. At COP, we will agree something and that is absolutely the case in in my world uh you'll all I, I hope have heard about mark carney's private finance initiative which has managed to create huge momentum behind the idea of private finance supporting the real economy's change as it gets to uh, net zero so we've had the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, 160 financial firms with 70 trillion of assets agreeing to support the move to uh, net zero. Um, uh, and we've also got them thinking about the real plans, not just the ambition 30 years away, but what are we going to do in the next five years that will start us on that trajectory to net zero? In my world, in the central bank and supervisors world, uh, we've got the NGFS, which is our, our network for greening of the financial system, my peers around the world. We've got commitments to deliver things by then. I'll be doing uh, a, a compare contrast of how all central banks are um, uh, undertaking scenario analyses and risk assessments of their financial uh, system. So I think that by COP, we will have committed by COP, we will have done, has uh, led to a real multiplicity of, uh, of commitments. The timing is very symbolic, right? We're five years on from Paris and we're at the start of a decade where we need decisive action if we are to have a hope of meeting the Paris uh, goal. So again, what does that mean for, uh, for corporate treasurers? I think there'll be pressure on you to set commitments, to set your ambition. And uh, I think in that context, there'll be more clarity from the authorities, both us as uh, the financial sector authorities and government as regulators of the real economy on how we get from here to net zero. So I think there'll be a desire for ambition, but some signposts along the way to help you get there. So Sarah, you, you mentioned the role of corporate treasurers, but, but do you really think um, that the voice of business will actually be heard at COP26? You mentioned, I mean, it's, a, it, it's the COP, of course, stands for the Conference of the Parties to the UN Convention on Climate Change. Um, and, it, and you referred to private finance. But in terms of businesses who actually have to undertake this effort, 
um, where, where we end up with outcomes from COP which are pragmatic and that are feasible for business to implement. So I think what we're trying to do here is kind of uh, marry the 30 year away ambition with the steps to get there. The people who can help us draw a line between those two dots are the business sector who can say that's practical, that isn't practical. We don't have that technological innovation happening at commercial, uh, at scale uh, at the moment. So I do think the voice of business is going to be really important in a UK context. Bayes will be putting out its net zero strategies, which talk about how we are going to achieve net zero in transport, in buildings, in the power industry. The voice of business is key in all of that. It's pointless as setting out whether as central banks and supervisors or governments uh, paths to net zero that are unachievable. We need your help in enabling us to draw a realistic but ambitious path that is consistent as far as we possibly can get with our aims. Uh, and Sarah, I'd, I'd like to move on to some questions about the, the role of central banks here, because um, I, I know the remit of the UK Monetary Policy Committee was updated in March this year to clarify that the committee should support the transition to net zero as part of the UK government's economic strategy. So what exactly is the role of central banks on climate change? Um, how is it differentiated from the role of politicians? Well, to solve climate change, we need to reduce emissions. <laughs> and the primary levers for driving that reduction in emissions do not rest with me as a, a central bank, but with governments through how they set climate policy, with industry through innovation and investment, with private finance through allocating funds to support that investment, and with consumers through the choices that they make. And it's that point about private finance allocating investment, which is where it comes back to, to my world, to central banking and uh, supervision, and where we have a really important role to catalyze, to complement and to amplify government efforts to achieve net zero. Uh, within that context, we have set ourselves the objective to ensure that the financial system, the macroeconomy and the Bank of England itself as a corporate is resilient to the risks from climate change and supportive of the transition to net zero. That, there's a lot that underlies that. Let me highlight three uh, things. The first is greening finance. What do I mean by that? I want to improve reporting and disclosure. And I want to transform risk management in the financial system so that every financial decision takes the risks and the opportunities from climate change into account. So that's the, the first thing. The second thing is to understand how climate change affects our economy uh, and our climate scenario analysis, our CBES that we released, uh, golly, it was just, uh, just last week, uh, sets out some scenarios that aim to cover exactly that. And then the third thing we do, James, and this is really important, we practice what we preach both in terms of our actions. We've said we will be net zero by uh, 2050 uh, at the latest. Uh, we're also a bank, so we need to consider our own financed emissions uh, and also through our disclosures. Uh, uh, we complied with the TCFD last year. Uh, we won an award for it. And indeed, uh, just today, we have released our second TCFD uh, disclosure uh, report. I'd encourage you all to read them. Um, uh, well, I would, I know, but they've got a lot of richness in there, both about how we are stewarding the financial system to support uh, the real economy on the transition and the actions that we're taking as a bank with a balance sheet. Uh, so for all of those things, through greening finance, through understanding the impact of climate change on our economy and through practicing what we preach, our aim is to play a really important role in supporting that transition. 
Um, so, Sarah, on on the greening um, of finance proposals, um, can I just ask you just for a minute to a bit more detail on um, the proposals that the bank set out last month for greening its corporate bond purchase scheme, um, sometimes known as CBPS. Um, the governor announced that from Q4 this year, um, the bank intends to modify its approach to the composition of assets it buys in order to take account of climate considerations. So this will be of interest to a number of yeah. corporate treasurers on the call. What, what impact will this new policy have? So our aim is to incentivize the transition to net zero. Uh, that's what our policy uh, approach is designed to do. An orderly transition requires efforts across every sector uh, in the in the uh, in the UK, and our aim is to improve the the incentives to deliver net zero. We're going to do that in a number of ways. We're going to set targets for where we want the emissions profile of the corporate bond uh, scheme to be. We're going to tilt our purchases so that we buy more of and so reward those that have got credible climate uh, ambitions and are delivering uh, real change. We're going to set eligibility criteria so at the right time we don't buy those bonds that are incompatible with the transition because they're not disclosing in line with TCFD or because their activity is incompatible with UK government policy on transition. And we'll escalate it through time so we can increase uh, our ambition. What we are not doing is widespread divestment with an aim of minimizing the current carbon footprint of the bonds we hold. We don't think that's the right thing to do. What we want to do is tilt our purchases to those with ambition and therefore support them in their actions to get ready uh, for net zero. Um, uh, divestment is a powerful tool and will be in our back pocket should we need it as a threat to reinforce incentives, but it's not our first, uh, first port of call. Thank you, Sarah. Um, the title of this session refers to a sustainable finance revolution, and I think it was Andrew Bailey himself who, who referred to the threat posed to our economies and our financial system by climate change as being a green swan event. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, you, you've talked a lot about change, but do you think that the financial system as a whole is transitioning fast enough? So look, the financial system's got a key role to play here because it's both exposed to the risk from climate change, the green swan event, and because through its actions, it can support the transition and so reduce the likelihood of a green swan event uh, happening. Uh, I gave a speech last month and in that I said that I judged that financial firms and businesses are likely currently underestimating the potential impact of climate change. And so green swan events where all of a sudden risks are repriced are not just possible, but even perhaps likely given our current capabilities, understanding and management of these risks. Now that's not a comfy place to be, but I am reassured because a lot is going on in terms of setting ambition and building capabilities that are designed to make sure we take different decisions today to deliver on those future ambitious commitments. So I'm confident that we're moving in the right direction, uh, but we're not there yet. You've, well, you've certainly been busy, Sarah, you mentioned your speech, but also you've recently launched, um, in fact, I think it was only last week, the Climate okay. Biennial Exploratory Scenario. I hope I've got that right, or, or CBES, I think you told me the acronym is. Um, That's right. So to, to, the, to the rest of us, the, these are climate change scenarios, um, but you'll, you'll probably correct me on that. Can you briefly summarise, however, um, what are the three climate scenarios within, within the exploratory scenario? What's the purpose of this exercise and who exactly is in scope for it? Uh, that's, there's a lot underlying that. I'll try and be quick, James. So there's three scenarios. We look ahead and we assume that we have a, 
early orderly transition to net zero by 2050 starting tomorrow. That's the, the Goldilocks, just a lovely uh, way of getting there. We call that the early action scenario. We also look at a late action scenario where uh, the necessary actions are delayed for a decade. And in consequence, we have a green swan event in the middle of it and uh, a climate Minsky moment, some economic disruption in the, because of a late transition. And then our third uh, scenario is one where we don't transition at all. We carry on on our current emissions pathway and we are exposed to the physical risks of, uh, of climate change. What we're hoping to do through that exercise is do three things. Firstly, shine a light on risks that are currently there but are opaque. Second, highlight where change needs to occur, because if there's a risk, we need to do something to mitigate that risk A business needs to uh, change its uh, approach. And then our third objective is to drive the improvement in risk management capabilities uh, that I said I was worried about uh, before that we didn't have so that we are all getting much better at trying to understand where these risks might arise and do a better job of managing them. The largest banks and insurers are a part of the test, but of course it's shining a light on the risks that are in their corporate customers, their household customers. So if you like, all of the, uh, uh, the uh, treasurers who are listening on this call are a part of, uh, of this exercise. We're, we're using the financial system as a mirror to see what's happening in uh, the real, uh, real economy. And so through the exercise, we hope to use those largest banks and insurers to understand what, their, uh, what will happen to their balance sheets, i.e. individuals and corporates, through those three different scenarios and get a better understanding of the risks and where we need to change. Thank you, sir. I find it really fascinating actually um, listening both to you and also some of the other sessions we've had this week. I and mean, if I think back a couple of years to, to our annual conference, already at that stage, companies were, were starting to have to consider the impact of, um, that they were having um, on climate change through their emissions and the scope one and two emissions. But there's a really in interesting um, shift is my observation that businesses increasingly are having to consider not only the impact of their current activities on climate change, but also the impacts of climate change on their future activities. Uh, and I think what you just described in the scenario is particularly playing for that latter bit about what's, uh, what impact will climate change have on the activities of business and therefore what does that mean for the the investment portfolios or funding portfolios of banks uh, and, and sorry you mentioned yeah. can i just sorry to interrupt but can no, i just please. add uh, one quick thing on that actually the economics um uh, in those three scenarios uh, are perhaps not a surprise but what the three scenarios show is that the best outcome for uh, our economy and uh, I expect for uh, financial risk is if we start to act now because we have an early orderly transition, uh, we manage to avoid the physical risks of, uh, of climate change as, as the planet gets hotter. And so if you like, you then get swung back to, these are the risks that the climate will pose to you and your actions can help then determine which of those scenarios we end up in. So it's a, a, a virtuous circle, uh, I hope, James. Uh, well, we, I think we probably all hope um, that. So, and Sarah, I, I, I'm not trying to be um, pedantic, of course, but you mentioned that these scenarios um, should be relevant to, to everyone listening to the call. And, and of course they will be, but in terms of those companies actually in a formal sense, in scope. Um, if I understood for it from the conversation you and I had the other day, I think it was like the top hundred counterparties, uh, yeah, kind of... counterpart or, or, or counterparties for each bank. And if I if I could just add on a question to that, please, which is that already um, we've received some feedback from some um, ACT members, corporate treasurers, that their businesses were receiving multiple requests from their banks to provide additional information related to their their climate footprints. 
Um, so that, that sort of begs the question of, is there a standardized data set? Mm -hmm. And in what way does this duplicate or substitute conversations that our corporate treasurers are having anyway with credit rating agencies? In many respects, the right answer here is TCFD and the IFRS producing standardized mandatory reporting for everybody, but we're not there yet, right? Mandatory reporting is due to come in, in, in the UK by 2025. The IFRS have only just started uh, looking at, at this issue, but we can't wait until those data sets are in place if we are to try and avoid the green swan events uh, we need to we need to uh, start now and that's why the firm the banks and the insurers are speaking to your members to try and understand what current risks are but also importantly what what your members plans are for dealing with those risks because the key thing here is to move from the static to the strategic right it's not where you are now it's where you are going to be and what plans you have uh, to to get there so i do believe that we'll get there with standardized reporting in time but in the meantime we are uh, experimenting um, i would encourage your members not to be spuriously accurate i would encourage them to do the qualitative as well as the quantitative i would encourage them to reuse material they have used for other uh, purposes uh, and then the final thing james i did want to say we tried to be proportionate in our ask here uh, when i first consulted uh, on the uh, the cbes proposal my aim was to go much broader because what I I really wanted was a view across the system as a whole, the entire balance sheet as to uh, where the risks were. But we sought to uh, hone it down and, and look to the, the largest. So, as I say, our aim is to be proportionate. And I, I hope your members will forgive us for experimenting rather than waiting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's, it leads in actually very nicely to an, another question we, we've had from um, some members that, that there are some corporate treasurers whose companies are at an early stage of their climate change transition with perhaps with poor metrics today. And they're concerned that an indirect consequence of the climate stress test may be that certain businesses labelled brown, I, I know they're not actually labelled brown, but effectively labelled brown, may become um, essentially yeah. locked out of sources of funding required for the investment to make the transition you were just describing. So how will you avoid that risk? Look, I can see why members are worried, but absolutely everything that we are doing is seeking to guard against that risk crystallising. I talk all the time, we talk all the time of the need for a whole economy transition, that this affects users as well as producers of, uh, of energy and that the this should all be about getting everybody over the line, incentivizing the transition rather than divesting. Uh, so what this is all about is kind of encouraging discussions with counterparties of banks and insurers on their plans. It's not on where firms are, but where they are going. And uh, our second objective is to highlight where action uh, is needed. We're not penalizing Brown through uh, capital uh, um, uh, requirements, uh, despite uh, some uh, uh, encouragement to do exactly that. And, and I come back to identifying the risk soon becomes identifying the opportunity this getting to net zero will be the biggest structural trend our economy faces over the next decade the financial system is an important part of solving uh, that problem in the way it was in helping provide financing through uh, the covid uh, stress so while i can understand their concerns i uh, uh, my aim throughout this our aim throughout this is that we talk about incentivizing and ensuring there is a whole economy transition where carbon stops being emitted not divestment which doesn't necessarily stop carbon being emitted and therefore doesn't necessarily mean we've solved the problem. 
Thank you, Sarah. I, I was just glancing down actually at some of the questions coming in, which we've been trying to pick off a few of them, but I've, I can see there's at least a couple relating to sort of international alignment and regulation. Mm. Uh, and we, we do have an international audience today, I understand over 50 um, countries. So do you expect to see close international alignment? Uh, and particularly, um, there's a question which I'll just slightly adapt. In, in the post-Brexit context, specifically, mm. do you anticipate alignment between the UK and EU rules on sustainable finance? And someone is asking about um, to what extent will the UK green taxonomy utilise the EU green taxonomy? So if you can elaborate so then, in that space, please, on international alignment, Sarah. Look, everybody recognises the need for action to be international here. This is a global problem that requires global solutions. And from the very start, that network for the greeting of the financial system that I talked about has sought to coalesce central banks and supervisors from around the globe on this topic. We started with eight members three and a half years ago, and now we are over 90, representing 85% uh, of emissions. There's a whole alphabet soup of international authorities uh, uh, supporting uh, the work here, whether it's the G7, the G20, the FSB, the BCBIS, the uh, IOSCO, you know, a, a real desire to um, harmonize and to push the world forward on these issues because this is a global uh, problem. We're keen to collaborate and learn from each other as, as well. So there are, there are many reasons that push uh, uh, my community towards uh, harmonization. I'll give you two small caveats of, around that. And it goes a bit to your question uh, about the EU green taxonomy. Transition paths are national. The green taxonomy for the European Union will reflect the transition path that the uh, EU politicians have set out. What we'll need for the UK is a green taxonomy that reflects the path that our politicians have allowed. So what we need is interoperability across those two so that we understand how they uh, fit together. So that's my first uh, caveat. We can harmonise, but we do need to recognise that transition paths are inherently national because they're inherently political. And then the second thing is it takes time uh, and kind of uh, we are all having a go, but there is a period of experimentation amongst my community as we try and work out exactly how to think about the financial risks from climate change and incorporate that in our regulatory and supervisory uh, mandates. Uh, so we won't necessarily be there tomorrow, but you can be completely sure that we will collaborate and you can be sure that wherever possible, we will aim to harmonize. And Sari, um, we've, during your talk, you, you've mentioned the word disclosure a couple of times and corporate treasurers may be feeling confused, not only by the multiplicity of acronyms you, you just mentioned, but also the multiplicity, <laughs> I won't try and repeat them all, uh, but also the multiplicity of non-financial reporting frameworks and new requirements and mandatory disclosures on climate. So, I mean, there are some, uh, e sometimes even the same requirements is mandatory for certain categories of large firm and voluntary for others. Um, so just very briefly, can you give us an idea, what does good look like for climate disclosures right now? So the G7 finance ministers and the central bank uh, governor's statement that was uh, released earlier uh, this month uh, had support for making TCFD uh, mandatory. TCFD is the go-to climate uh, disclosure. There's loads of great guidance around how to do that and, and building through time. So this is what a year one looks like, a year two, a, a, a year three. I've had a go at it at the, at the Bank of England. It really does uh, work. So I think TCFD is a really important part of that. And in the UK, we've already committed to make it uh, mandatory by 2025 at the, at the latest with most of the good work done uh, before then. Another really important part of this is going to be the uh, IFRS to, uh, uh, and they have committed to uh, put together a sustainability standards board. That's another area where we're looking to get 
harmonized uh, disclosures and reporting uh, from around uh, uh, the globe. And that's because we need consistent, comparable, decision useful information if we're going to drive capital to where it needs to go to support that orderly transition. But I was just asking Sarah um, about the role of the Bank of England in greening its own portfolio and its own activities. So Sarah, over to you. Uh, well, look, we have experienced uh, for ourselves how difficult it is to put metrics, especially forward looking metrics on uh, what's going uh, on with uh, uh, climate change. We have used third parties to help us do that, uh, get in some uh, expertise to, uh, to help ensure that we do as good a job as we can of trying to understand forward looking uh, risks. On um, non-green assets and kind of what are we going to do with those non-green assets that are, are in our portfolio, our aim is through uh, the uh, engagement uh, that we, uh, we have through this framework that we're putting together, we're going to encourage you all to become less, uh, less dirty and uh, more green by tilting our purchases to those who are ambitious, encouraging you to, uh, to disclose and where that doesn't happen, uh, if necessary, removing eligibility. So our aim with those non-green assets is to play our part in turning them uh, green. And then finally, uh, James, your comment about um, uh, central bank digital currency is well made. Bitcoin's energy consumption... I'm sorry, sorry for interrupting, sir. I'm not sure because we got cut off. I don't know if everyone heard the question, oh. which was that the data processing for blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies is very energy intensive. Will this be a limiting factor in particular for developing a sterling central bank digital currency? And I'll say really quickly, Bitcoin is particularly energy inefficient. Not all uh, such uh, technologies are, and we are committed to make sure that ours is not if we develop one. Thank you, Sarah. Well, sadly, we, we lost a couple of minutes, but, but I would like to, um, uh, now that we're nearing the end of our time, um, just ask you a final question, which is um, for, for our audience today of CFOs and corporate treasurers of non-financial corporates, what would be your, your sort of one piece of advice to, to our audience, please? So expectations on this issue are rising. We all need to stretch our horizons and take actions now, decades before the consequences of inaction are clear. That requires board level conversations and a strategic approach. Uh, none of us know exactly what to do here. Kind of the issues are unprecedented by definition. We're all learning by doing. So my advice would be have a board level conversation don't wait for perfection. It's better to be roughly right now than precisely right when it's too late. Collaborate. We all need to get over uh, the line. Be brave and tell your story publicly and with your financiers. They can help you solve the problems. Lara, that, that's all great advice. Um, I, I know you advocate learning by doing. And that's um, <laughs> a theme I've heard in other sessions this week, actually that momentous change can be achieved by a series of incremental stepping stones and as you suggest by sharing best practice. So Sarah, it's been an absolute privilege um, having you address the ACT annual conference. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. And I'd also like to thank members of the audience who contributed um, questions. Um, we managed to cover as much ground as possible, but I do apologize if we didn't get to your particular question. Um, if I could please make the request to everyone to fill in the quick survey before leaving this session, you'll find the feedback buttons under the participate tab and we really do appreciate your feedback. So, so thank you for just taking a moment to do that. Don't forget that of course you can watch recordings of all this week's sessions and please stay tuned um, for the conference closing remarks by the ACT Chief Executive Caroline Stockman that follow immediately after this session. But for now, on behalf of the audience, may I repeat our thanks to Sarah Breeden and the Bank of England for some fascinating insights into the accelerating impact of climate change. This has been James Winterton for the ACT. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>